Hey everyone, Sloan here. Um, this is a really good episode. I know I say that all the time um, because, you know, it's I guess it's in my enlightened self-interest to make sure that uh, what we put out here is really interesting all the time. Um, but in this case, it's extra interesting because we're talking about the legacy of this larger-than-life figure, David Swenson, who led the Yale University Investments Office for probably, I, I think, about as long as I've been alive um, and, you know, probably is more the guy, in air quotes, um, in institutional investing than anyone else. He's probably the most imitated investor in the history of the world. And I, I mean that even including Warren Buffett, who people sort of say they're imitating. There are a lot of people who say that they're in, quote unquote, Buffett-style partnerships. Um, but if you were to look at the number of firms that claim that versus the number of firms that claim that they're running endowment model partnerships, which are you know almost always influenced by David Swenson, um, the, the latter would, would vastly trump the former. Um, he died of cancer, which we hate. Um, very, very anti-cancer here at the Pre-Money Podcast. Um, but we were lucky to be joined by uh, one of his friends, protégés, um, Ted Seides, who you might know from the Capital Allocators podcast if you're you know, sort of out here swimming in the, in the world of institutional investing podcasts, which we're sure you are. Um, Ted sort of helped us make sense of what this you know, very important figure to him, very important figure to the rest of the industry means, what we should take away from his life, um, and, and really like, you know, how notable he was for just this one quality of being able to stick to his knitting um, and sort of do him, which is the sort of thing that we set up this podcast to celebrate and uh, proselytize for. So I hope that sounds cool to you, that you're excited, and, you know, I, I guess in my wildest dreams, I hope that you're thinking about sharing the Free Money Podcast with a friend or writing a, a, a review on your podcast store of choice. It would just be a very nice thing. Um, anyway, without further ado, here's our conversation with Ted Seides. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. Here comes the money. Welcome to the Free Money Podcast. It's where we give you the Brooklyn Bay Area consensus about institutional investing that you crave and so and you do so crave it. You you may even be jonesing for mm -hmm. it. Well, yeah, I mean this is a makeup for, for we had a lost episode in between this oh, one. I know. I have a tear. We have a lost episode, which good news, we've now upgraded our technology mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. order to never have that occur again. <laughs> I mean, I do like the, the mystery of having a lost episode, but let's reveal nothing further about it uh, until we reschedule the guest. Last, last little bit, Sloan. I have my half of the episode. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. You have, you have, your, you have your half. I have my half. We just don't have the guest speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point, we could just publish the episode and let people guess the hell yeah. we're talking about like that'll yeah, exactly. be like, well, it's like 20 years from now they'll like play this you know when free money has like won some kind of a nobel prize for literature i'm expecting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh then we'll they'll play it and people have to guess who the guest was <laughs> well yeah i mean I, it's just it's so mysterious you know i'm almost like i'm thinking of garfield minus garfield which is that amazing web comic that just took everything that uh all the humans say out of or takes everything Garfield says out of Garfield. Yeah. Um, and you're left with this, this just meditation on existential dread um, where John totally. is talking to his cat and no one's talking <laughs> back. You know, Sloan, I, I had a crazy thing this week um, related to the vaccines. Mm. So I'm encouraging everybody to get vaccinated. And there's a little bit of an origin story related to the Free Money podcast here. Oh, wow. So that's why I feel like maybe I'll kick it off with just some little personal mm -hmm. news. So our listener, and he, he's the one listener that we know we have, <laughs> um, uh, Treasurer Reed in Shout out. the great state T. of Oregon. Reed, what up? Whoop, whoop. Um, Treasurer Reed reached out to me in April and said, Ashby, you're a fairly creative human being. Um and we debated that for a little bit back and forth just to see if that was true. And then he said, do you have any creative um, ideas for how we can get more Oregonians vaccinated? 
And, and you were uh, like blockchain. And I was like full on blockchain. <laughs> no, I did not say that. I said, let's get inspired by long game, my friend. Let's build a, a vaccine lottery. And he's like, well, do you want to pitch the uh, governor on that? And I said, it would be my delight. And I did. And this was the end of April. Wow. Yeah. You, you, this is news to you, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Yeah, man. You yeah. Know. We're doing it live here, people. Sloan doesn't even know about this. It's not like Sloan's tracking, tracking what I'm doing. And uh, on Friday, I did a press conference with the governor of Florida where we unveiled, take your shot, comma, Oregon. And it includes Aww. a million dollar jackpot, 36 $10,000 prizes. And we're going to try to get a bunch of Oregonians that were sitting on the fence to go and get the vaccine. That's so great. Yeah. And in the midst of it, of course, Ohio came out and did this big announcement and kind of stole our thunder. But it's all good. We're just trying to, you know, make a positive impact on the planet. Mm -hmm, Uh, And mm -hmm. in fact, Ohio was showing some really good data. So it actually helped us um, make the decision and move quickly. But yeah, that was that was my week. um, This makes me think that I I moved too fast in getting the vaccine. Like if I had held out, I might have been able to might have been eligible for for some sort of prizes. Oh, but you are still eligible. And if you live in Oregon, um, we designed it so that all the parties who have gotten vaccinated can participate. And um, the odds are still fantastic. Um, the only uh, thing I wanted to bring up here, and this is really why I brought it up, because I'm just a little bit crabby. They didn't go with my names. Um, I had a couple of fantastic names for this. They call it, you know, they, their name was Take, Your, Take a Shot, Oregon. Mine was Get Rich or Live Trying. Aww. Herd annuity, herd annuity, herd annuity. Ugh. I mean, you're not loving these. That's too clever by half. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, I I I love a good annuity joke uh, as much as much as anyone else. But uh... (laughs) if only people could hear the face that you just made. Yeah. (laughs) When you when you heard my my two name ideas. I'm trying. I'm translating it into into voice. You always lose something in translation, but you know. Oof. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> anyway, that was my big week. That was my. So I'm feeling a little bit. Um, you know, I've never done a press conference with a governor that you know gets a little bit of attention. So I, I had That's my. That's really fair, cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I did have my fair share of like hardcore right wing people who think the vaccines are injecting Bill Gates a five G reach out to me mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. some angry, um, you know, outreach. But aside from that, crazy outreach has been overwhelmingly positive. So it's it's important to get outreach from crazy people as well as part of yeah, as, as keeps part of grounded. crazy outreach. You yeah, know, in case you think you're doing great in the world, so there's some, some crazy people out there to remind you that you're not. Yep. Um, but so that's my personal news. How about I jump into the news? News. The new, the actual news. Did I mean? I did anything news. happen in the in the two months since we last released the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. Dear God. Yeah, a couple things. Um, here's my favorite bits of news. This uh, just out um, about two weeks ago, the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds pulled together some uh, direct investment data um, on sovereign wealth fund investment activity. And I was kind of blown away to see that the direct investing um, by sovereign funds doubled uh, in 2020 vis a vis 2019. In other words, they did about $66 billion of direct investing in 2020 uh, versus around 35 in 2019. And it, you know, it's remarkable because you could think these guys are out uh, bargain hunting. But also, like normally, I think of direct investments like that as requiring airplanes, hotels, yeah. and conference no rooms. Yeah. Um, so for those of you that thought that like being stuck at your home behind a zoom would slow down the investment activity, well, stop thinking that you just got to talk to the right, uh, sovereign wealth funds, you know, yeah. um, you've been, if they didn't, if they didn't invest in you and you sort of justified to yourself in the mirror, well, <laughs> you know, it's the COVID, you know, this is a little splash of cold water for you. Yeah. Nice buzzkill. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, well go to Oregon and. 
get vaccinated, maybe I'll yeah, exactly. You, you, you can still That's work literally out. free money. Okay, that's what we do here. <laughs> um, okay, news item number two, which is a little bit more positive. Tomasek is a sovereign wealth fund in Singapore, and they have just helped to launch a new exchange. Hmm. Um, it is a carbon credit exchange, specifically in quotes, high quality carbon credits by hmm. the, before the end of the year. And for those of you in the space is actually pretty profound because all of these big pension funds are now in this um, focus on getting to uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, right? Well, how are they going to do it? Part of what they're going to have to do is they're going to need to do it in a voluntary way, go participate in these carbon credits. And I don't know how familiar you are, Salon, with the carbon credit space, but it's kind of like the Wild West. You know, yeah. once you make, once you invest the money in this stuff, it's kind of gone. Um, yep. And so the words high quality are really important there. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I've been getting really into like permaculture recently due to, you know, the, in, the introduction of the roof garden. Um, and mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. funny, actually, like the, these high quality carbon credit things play into a lot of conservation business models like the. Um, I was just watching something about a farmer in New Zealand who has figured out a way to let what is traditionally considered an invasive herb or an invasive plant just grow um, and then kind of die out in order to support the growth of native old growth forest. And the way that they're funding the whole thing is in part through carbon credits. I love uh, it. It's so cool that, that, you know, you can have this person in the, you know, kind of Western Bay of New Zealand, you know, find access, you know, like find a market for all the good that they're doing in, in their local environment. Sloan, did we just come up with another business concept here for free money? Because part of me <laughs> wonders if we might facilitate the flow of money to my garden, <laughs> to our gardens, you know, That's you a give idea. us money and mm. we will show you the plants that I planted in my garden. Mm. And we can have some kind of a carbon credit program for me to plant more fruit trees. It's going to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Like That's what, a good point. I'm, I'm kind of being serious here. Like, why can't we use our, like, why don't big institutions pay us to plant plants we want to plant? That's a great point. You know, the, the Bedford Stuyvesant uh, rooftop urban farming area is crazy criminally underinvested yeah. in by institutional investors. Yeah. I am thinking about starting a uh, Los Gatos carbon offset program <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> Personally, I'm just trying to grow a whole bunch of snap peas. Yeah, but that's carbon too, isn't that's it? That's true, yeah. Some kind of something here. Last news item uh, b before we get to our secret guest. Mm. Um, <clears throat> we... We had, uh, maybe we'll just jump to David Swenson. Sadly, um, we had news this month that David Swenson uh, passed away. He was the legendary mm -hmm. investor. Um, Yale Endowment defined the endowment model, Sloan, and then that mm -hmm. became known as the Yale model, um, yep. copied around the world, perhaps in my mind, the most copied model in the world of institutional investment. Um, yes, Because definitely. it's copyable. The yeah. Canadian model is very hard to copy. You have to hire 2,000 people. Um, the endowment model, you can do it with six people. It's just about portfolio construction. And, and unfortunately, um, David died way too young. I think he was 67 years old. It's a fantastic yep. obituary in the Wall Street Journal um, written by Don Lim. Um, I'm going to blank on the other author. But really fantastic if, for anybody that wants to go and learn more about, about David. Yeah. Uh, there's also a great piece in Institutional Investor that we'll link in the in the thing by uh, show friend Alicia. Um, That's right. But our secret guest worked at the Yale Investment Office. Yes, he uh, did. Yeah, and like you know, is willing to put give the secrets on tape to us only. Yeah. <laughs> Live um, now. And is also an all around nice guy. Uh, welcome, Ted Sides. Yeah. Hi, Ted. Sloan and Ash. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> You're on other people's podcast now, Ted. How great is that? I, I'm trying to wind down. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> I get to I get to understand how other people interview, huh? 
<laughs> How we make do podcasts? Yeah, to we're, evaluate we're... other people in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> Are you already judging us, Ted? Not yet, but it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, our commitment to anarchy uh, in this podcast, I think, is pretty deep, and hopefully, it shows through to the you yeah know, the, the, every every seam that we have knitting it all together. Our classic line is, "Let's do it live." Yeah. Um, you know, the question, the answer, we'll do it live. But in this case, Ted, we're calling on you um, precisely because of your um, obvious history at Yale. I think you were an undergrad at Yale. I was. And then you worked. And there was a very cute picture of uh, David Swenson and you at a graduation that was in your email newsletter. Yeah, at age, what, I was 21. He was probably 38. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Well, really, that was was yesterday. Yeah, I was going to say. (laughs) You haven't aged at all, Ted. You look fantastic. Oh, man. (laughs) Um, Look, we want to talk to you about. David, we just talked a little yeah. bit on the on the pod about how he really defined a model that I think is probably the most copied model in the world because it's copyable. You know, you, you don't need 2000 people like the Canadian pensions. You can probably do the Yale model with like a core group of investors and middle and back office folks, but not more than 15 people, 20 people. Um, but I think for you, um, Ted, we're curious on this first question, like, how did that model that that David developed, the endowment model, evolve over time? How did he talk about it? Did he change how he adhered to that model? Just talk to us a little bit about that, you know, the evolution of that endowment model from the beginning to the end. Well, I have to start by saying I left the investment office in 1997. So my inside baseball is a little bit dated. It's 25 uh, years. Yeah. You know, yes, I, I, so I do think things have evolved. What's interesting about it is there's a lot that hasn't evolved because it's not supposed to. Um, so what you could read in pioneering portfolio management that I would argue is just the tip of the iceberg has to do more with structure, policy allocation, strategic allocation, what makes sense to do with a long lived asset with limited spending needs, limited net spending needs. Um, and so those first principles of equity orientation and diversification and searching for, searching for inefficient markets, um, paying attention to structure and fees and who your partners are, all of that is foundational and for sure carried through straight through the day with, with no exception. If anything, one of the many aspects of David's genius was his extreme discipline um, to staying to those uh, – those tenants. And I just thought of this word earlier today, talking to somebody about uh, that I haven't seen used in anything. I, I, the little bit that I wrote and what other people did, which is he definitely had an element of righteousness to him. It's probably exactly the right word to describe it. Like he, he believed that the way he viewed investing was right and that other ways were wrong. Um, and that is fascinating. A gift and a curse. It's a gift if you're, generally speaking, ahead of the game and and correct, which he was far more often than not. (laughs) Um, But, you know, there's also this notion of, you know, what happens when the facts change. Um, So those are the aspects that were in place back then, um, which he wrote about 20 years ago and no doubt are still in place today. That gets you to having five people in an office trying to copy what Yale is doing quite unsuccessfully. and so what was interesting and the stuff that I miss, um, as does everyone, unless you were underneath the tent, is that he was incredibly creative and innovative all the time in, in micro ways. Hmm. Um, so like the first example of that, which again, you could say is foundational in first principles, was he wrote his graduate thesis on... Um, research that showed that corporate bonds do not compensate you for the risk that you take relative to owning treasuries and equities together. Mm. And so Yale never owned corporate bonds. Now you could look at that and say, really? Like never? Like Mm. what about distressed or what about, you know? And yeah, I mean, sometimes markets give you opportunities, but for the most part, if you look at other pools of capital, most of them have allocations to corporate bonds. And if David was right, and keep in mind, this is based on rigorous academic research that I'm sure he reviewed over the years, and he probably is right, 
you know, relative to the correct compensate the, the rec- correct composition of, of treasuries and equities, um, he's going to win, and other people are going to lose by a tiny by a tiny amount, right? Like these aren't these aren't big gaps, but over thirty five years, tiny amounts matter. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. There's there's rigorous rebalancing, and you know when I was at Yale before ETFs were products, the rigorous rebalancing meant you'd calculate up all your exposures with your managers and your markets, particularly in public equities and fixed income and some of the more liquid things. And you'd figure out who was doing better than other people and you'd trim from the good ones and you'd give it to the bad And, and that process took a couple of weeks. Um, now my understanding is they got to the point where they rebalanced intraday all the time. And so if you believe that the asset allocation targets are there and that markets themselves will be more volatile than they are one directional, that's the math of when rebalancing this constant proportion rebalancing works, the more you do it, the more you add tiny, tiny amounts of value. Um, and so there were things, so fees is a great one to talk about, <laughs> right? Because Yale had a first mover advantage in many ways. The most impactful was their allocations to, to the top venture capital managers. And I could tell you when I worked there, you had time. If you were investing in venture capital, you could go figure out who was good and who wasn't. And if you made mistakes, you could invest in the next fund. Uh, Yale did not invest in Benchmark Fund 1. I distinctly remember that. It was an eBay fund. It did wildly successful. My guess is that they are a significant benchmark investor today, but I don't know for sure. Um, So that's a first mover advantage. The other is in all of – because Yale – most, if not all of Yale's new investments are with new fund managers. And that's been the case for 30 something years. You become a price maker. You're not a price taker. So if you look at the structure of Yale's, let's say, absolute return portfolio, their hedge fund investments, um, I don't know this factually today because I don't see it, nor do any of us. But back when I was there, every investment that Yale made was in a fund of one where they were the sole LP. And they dictated terms at the time that seemed fair. And fair back then was one in 20. In fact, not only was it one in 20, but as I was leaving in the in, in 97 to go to business school, short-term interest rates were 6 or 7%. And David woke up one day and said, well, if short-term rates are 6% and my manager's borrowing stocks and they have a cash rebate that's like five, why am I paying them 20% of five to show up? Like they're getting another 1% return. At the time, all the fee structures were 1 in 20. So Yale systematically went out to all their hedge fund managers and had this conversation. And generally speaking, one of three things happened. Either the manager said, yeah, you're right. Let's change it. And they put in a cost capital hurdle. In one case, um, the manager said, well, you're right. I don't really want to have a cost of capital, but what if you just don't pay us a management fee? We don't need that. But we would like to earn our keep and keep the 20% carry. Um, and in other cases, people said, well, I understand what you're saying, but like, that's not what I'm doing for my other investors. And Yale would say, okay, thank you. We'll take our money back. Um, there were examples of great fund managers. I mean, I, I'll mention one that I remember from my time there when John Jacobson left Harvard uh, to start Highfields. He talked to Yale. David had known him for years. David had tried to say, hey, John, if you're so upset that Harvard's disclosing your compensation, come work at Yale. You could do the same thing and we'll pay you a whole lot less. No one will ever know. Um, he chose not to do that. And when he launched Highfields, rightfully so, he gave Harvard a very special deal. And David, who had known him for years, said, we love you. We'll, we'll take the same deal. And John said, well, no, they're, you know, I was at Harvard. And David said, thanks, but no thanks, and never invested in Highfields. So most allocators do not have the discipline to say, I know there's a super talented person in front of me. That person won't take my terms. I'll just go find another one. Um, so there are all kinds of little ways, and this is, by the way, this is my knowledge from 25 years ago. I can only imagine what's happened over the last 25 years in the micro innovations, um, that they pursued. I'll give you another fun one. Back when I was there, our U S equity portfolio, which was then 20 or 25%. Now it's much smaller, um, based on academic research was biased towards we small cap and value. Like we created these matrices, we take the market, we segment it by capitalization and by style, maybe price to book and say, we want to have more small cap value because that's what the academic research shows. There were no factors then. There was no, you know, 
that was to do that, you had to go out and identify a manager who was invested in small cap value because they liked small cap value, not because they had some fundamental belief that it was better over the long term. And so sure enough, Yale's portfolio was small cap value. About 15, 20 years ago, I remember having a conversation with them and said, we really think this quality stuff is interesting. You're like, what, what are you talking about? Well, you know, if we buy businesses and they're just going to grow over time, we have a really long horizon. So we're tilting our portfolio towards names that we just think are better businesses over time. There was no quality factor. There was a, so they just were so, he was so creative and innovative on figuring out things that worked and they're all tiny little additions to the portfolio across the whole portfolio, compounding on each other over time. One of the things I'm hearing though, too, is there's a degree of comfort being weird um that seems to underpin all of those things right and like as we as you've watched the yale the whole yale thing go from like this niche thing that your 38 year old friend david swenson was involved in and and a job to like the most emulated thing on earth it's gone from being this thing that you know was predicated on weirdness uh you know sticking to knitting and it's become something that people are now trying to imitate um how has that been for you to observe over time? Um, and like, what are, are there sort of fun things that have come out of watching people try to imitate that process? Um, uh, well, so I, I, I strike, a, I strike a difference with the, the term weird. So let's start with different. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, weird in a good way to be clear. Yeah. Well, no, totally. I understand. But um, the way that David approached things, it was sort of, what today you call evidence-based investing, which again was not a term. It was first principles, what works in the markets, what is the correct way to do things, and then pursue it that way. If that happens to be different from how everyone else is looking at it, that didn't bother him at all. Um, and so, you know, that core kind of innovation, if you call it that, of diversifying your equity exposure across what should be a very equity-laden portfolio um, is total common sense. The challenge that people face is how do you make change when there's all kinds of inertia uh, and job risk and all these things we know to be truths in investing. And for David, the truth is like that was a personality quirk. Like he just he just didn't care. Like if there was a point in time when um, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think this was back way before ESG. Uh, and there was some student motion about, you know, divesting from fossil fuels 30 years ago, which, you know, presumably if that had happened, maybe we wouldn't be in the predicament we are today. That said, David believed deeply that the purpose of managing the capital was to compound it at the highest rates. And any time you constrained your investment universe, that was a negative. Um, and so he once said to the president of Yale, okay, that's fine if you want to do that. I'll just leave. Um, and he would have if things couldn't mm. have been done his way. So so what I would say is that, I, you know, I wasn't aware when I was a kid working there that um, this was so powerful. It was just the only thing I knew and learned. I was like, well, why doesn't everybody else do this? This is so easy. Like, all you have to do is do it this way. It makes sense. And that's kind of what we all learned. Um, I think anytime something's interesting and works in markets, you do see people gravitate towards it. And usually this is kind of like a, the chef and the cook issue. Like David was the true chef and there are lots and lots of cooks. By the way, there are some terrific chefs that are just saying, this is the right model. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use it also. Um, and what always struck me was was the difference between what people people claim or they, they talk about the Yale model, the endowment model. And that means different things to different people. It certainly meant something different to David who didn't coin the phrase mm. than it does to everybody else. Um, so there are a lot of subtleties that I found to be fundamental misunderstandings when people ascribe uh, what that model means to Yale or to David compared to what I believe it meant to him and to Yale uh, are, are quite different sometimes. The one question I have in the way you described kind of David's early insight around rebalancing and the value you can extract from that. Um, it implies like a pretty strong view on strategic asset allocation and what, one of the, maybe, and maybe this is the difference between the chef and the cooks, but a lot of people today that are practicing what would be perceived as a more pure form of the endowment model have no asset allocation. 
it's it's kind of like a bottom up approach to finding different equity risk um, managers, getting deep alignment. So like if you think about Rob, like Rob Wallace at Stanford, I don't know Rob very well, but but like from the people that operate around him. Um, I've heard, you know, it's very much bottom up and it's about deep understanding of managers. And it, it, there isn't a sense of like a really strong view on asset allocation. Is that something that's evolved over time or is that just a nuance that you don't pick up in that rebalancing comment? Um, so, no, I think that's an evolution um, that is a function of capital market pricing environment. Got it. So if you look back 20 years ago and equities were priced, let's just take the GMO seven-year assumptions that everyone's familiar with, but if if equities were priced roughly to make their long-term expected returns and bonds were as well, which is you know a lesser return, um, for the most part, asset class returns when put together can do a reasonably close job of getting you to your spending needs, if not you know in excess of that. And then all of the work you're doing to try to add value is sort of icing on the cake. If you're in an environment, and particularly a long-term environment, where the asset class returns themselves are likely to not get you much, um, what's the point of driving your investments based on the asset classes? So that, that's the first point. The second point, which is something that I always scratch my head about, which is the, the seminal study that leads CIOs to say that asset allocation is the driver of performance is this Roger, Roger Ibbotson piece that had to do with the cross-sectional returns across asset classes. Looking backwards, the same people who will cite that study, including David, would also say very strongly that they can't time markets. Well, if you can't time markets, why should markets be the driver of your return going forward? Kind yeah. of an interesting juxtaposition. So I, I think that's that's more one of my pet peeves than than the former. Mm. But I think what what's happened is that um, the the asset classes that look positioned to generate the kinds of returns that meet spending needs are fewer, are generally in private markets, are generally in less efficient areas, particularly venture capital and private equity. And so if you're a CIO and you say like we can look over a long period of time and say our asset class returns are two, three, four, five percent ahead of an index. The index itself is only going to make us two or three. Why do we care what the index is today? So that's the first part. The second part I would say is that even those pools, Stanford, Notre Dame, MIT, probably being the most prominent that have shifted their mindset towards fewer asset classes and, and manager selection, um, they still have the asset class composition structure, and they still use that as a reporting tool for their committee. So people generally can understand much more easily, where are we in US equities? Where are we in international equities? Where are we in venture capital? So they use it as a reporting tool. They use it with a common sense risk filter from the top down. They're just not using it to drive manager decisions and position sizing. Hmm. Yeah, that, that gets me thinking about like how you use the insights from this big figure, right? Like as a practical matter in your own life, right? Um, you know, I mean, there's this person who's tremendously influential. I saw him called the Peter Lynch of institutional investing, which to me doesn't quite get there. Like uh, <laughs> um, I would go maybe like Jack Bogle of institutional investing or something like that. Like, I mean, Peter Lynch feels like a, a different tier. Um, but like this person becomes this voice in your head do you listen to this voice all the time? <laughs> like, how do you use the voice? How do you interact with it? I mean, in the first bunch of years after I left, right, any voice that's in your head day to day when you're away from it starts to fade. Um, and you go off on your own and, and you try to remember some of those principles and how you'd apply it. But there was always this, like, what would David think for a long time? Um, but then you don't have the answer to that. So you have to kind of figure things out on your own. And um, one of the one of the great success factors of Yale, one of the many, but one of them was David, right? This was, it was him, it was his model, it was his innovations, it was his team, it was his ideas, it was his decisions at the end of the day about managers. And so like, when I went out, like, I'm not him. And so the kinds of managers or biases I might have started with what I learned from him because what you learn is what you adopt to. And, um, you know, almost all of those disciplines I found to be spot on. Now, what I found was that 
to really internalize that, I had to kind of figure out what worked for me. And in terms, what, what I would find is I would go, you know, say, well, I know that like Yale doesn't invest in a quant manager, but you know, I have a different theory about quant. Let me go find a great quant manager to invest in. And what do you know? It wouldn't work. Um, and I kept coming back to, no, he was right. No, he was right. And there are very few things, you know, over my career um, where I look back and say, boy, I was so right about something that he didn't have right. I'm not sure if there are any of those. Um, <laughs> there are managers at times that worked out that they didn't invest in that, you know, I had in the past and, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, I think that's important. The other thing is that very, very little that he did um, was replicable by anyone else and um, the seat itself, All right? So had David left and taken five or $10 billion of cash, uh, I'm not sure what he would have done with mm. it. He might've been able to wiggle into some of those amazing relationships because of who he was, but he may not have. Um, so there was, and, and you see that because the, the, the peers of mine, the colleagues of mine from back then who subsequently left, you know, and Andy Golden, the Seth Alexander, Paul Valent, and Ellen Schumann, on and on. Um, if you go back 15 to 20 years ago when they left, you had plenty of time to build a portfolio basically of Yale's managers because they didn't know anybody else. Right? If that was the only place they worked, you knew who Yale had money with and you want to have as many of those as you can. Um, I'm kind of curious about like a Peter, Peter Ammon, who's terrific, but went to Penn probably now eight years ago, but not that long ago. And by then people had caught up mm. and some of Yale's great managers were closed. I don't know what, how much was he able to replicate and evolve from there. Mm. But what you saw was that if you just took some of the basics of the structure and the group of managers and evolved from there, every single one of those people I worked with generated outstanding returns for their institutions kind of going forward from there, from that similar, not first mover advantage, but early enough. Um, and some of the basic principles of how to construct and manage a portfolio. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question of like, what does anybody do going forward? You know, when you describe all that, it reminds us kind of us of, of a mentor or a coach and um, having, you know, I was kind of like a, a pretty good rower one time, like 400 years ago. Um, and, and our coach who went on to coach the national team to a gold medal was like notorious for being like one of the toughest human beings on earth. I won't even say his name cause I don't want him to find me and talk to me. Um, just so scary. I still, <laughs> that's, that's in no way in line with the stereotype about rowing, by the I, way. I still sit, I'm 44 years old now. I still sit up in the middle of the night wondering if I'm late for practice, right? Like that, that's like the psychological torment that was created. Um, this dude had a reputation for never, um, cutting anybody. He would just put you through so much psychological warfare that you would quit. And if you chose not to quit, he decided there was something weird about you that he respected. Anyway, I'm wondering somebody who has had this much success and created these many superstar endowment map, like, like, was he tough? Like, was he a, a hard ass? Did he create a culture of fear? You know, like Bridgewater? What was it? What was the culture yeah. like? No. Um, well, I, you know, I think it depended on, on how senior you were. So okay. as a junior person, it was very much like a family. Wow. Um, he, he's a warm guy. He loved teaching, um, but he had a lot to teach. And your job was just to absorb what he taught. Where the rubber tended to meet the road at times was when people developed their own beliefs that were different from his. Uh, and that's true both inside the office and outside the office. So, you know, I'll tell you one story. Um, uh, I had a summer job when I left and went to business school with, with a hedge fund that Yale had money with for 20 years. They, they no longer do. Um, and, you know, when I was at Yale, I just thought we were everyone's favorite client, right? That we would walk in, people were super nice to us. And we'd have these really interesting conversations and people would tell me, oh my God, what an amazing job you have. And I was just like, wow, the people in this industry are so nice. Um, I didn't fully have an appreciation that I was sitting on the top of you know, someone else's food chain. Um, and so when I got to New York in the summer of 1998, and I talked to a couple of the managers that I knew that Yale had money with, they would kind of say, you know, like, yeah, Yale's our favorite client. They put us in business. They're kind of our least favorite client too. I said, you know, what do you mean? 
and and this particular manager who I'm still quite friendly with today said for 20 years, Yale would probably come in their office, say twice a year, a couple hours, do the full blown, go through the portfolio, poke prod. And for 20 years, twice a year, they thought they were gonna get fired after the meeting. So David in particular, David and Dean Takahashi had a reputation of being like just insanely tough on managers. Um, but it wasn't like that in the office. I do think as people got senior and you know, you did have a number of people, there, there are a lot of people who had worked at Yale who are now chief investment officers somewhere else. There are far fewer who stayed around for the long, long term. Um, all of those people started right out of undergraduate without maybe there's a few exceptions now but um and there's something to that right like i think it was david's shop and it was his way or the highway and there wasn't a lot of room to think differently from how he thought and fortunately for yale like he is one of the greatest you know of all time yeah i mean like that you know that is it gets i'm going back to that thought of yale as an unusual place and you know incidentally we with every guest uh do the same thing uh as yale does biannually so you know, <laughs> gird your loins yeah it's about um, to get real tough I, yeah. I don't see it i don't see it coming sloan Ash, i just don't you know maybe you can blind me but i don't see it coming from you guys um well you know i mean we're, we're very tough after after dark you know um but uh <laughs> I don't know if the knuckle cracking is. Uh, it's, not is it's coming through. It's, it's it coming through. Me. I hear it. It's not. It's I hear it. I hear it. But you know, it's not. <laughs> you're not buying the. You're not buying not, the brand. Uh, not the bad yet. Girl brand. Not yet. No. Well, like I, I mean, a couple of the things that I've read about Yale doing, I mean, um, are like, I mean, there was an anecdote someone shared about like sending a, a you know a CPA with a bow tie in an agreeable attitude out to uh, all of these managers, right, in order to like kind of make become like a favorite person um you know for, sounds for like these... something charlie ellis would say <laughs> it wasn't um, yale yeah. magazine it does seem like I, I adore charlie he's very colorful with his anecdotes i i don't know right like <laughs> yeah. did, did that become you know alex banker i think used to wear bow ties maybe he still does <laughs> he was the operations due diligence guy he's quite a friendly person i don't maybe maybe that was the case right well, I, I was thinking also about the, you know, the, the golf and tennis things that happen. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, like that, that seems like a really huge driver of communication with managers and culture and, and like culture creator. Yeah. I mean, most of the time that managers came through Yale, that was their main, that was their day. So it wasn't like you had a one hour meeting in New York and you're going to another office and another office, another office. You're just coming out there for the day and you're going to give Yale as much time as they wanted. So part of that, you'd sit around the office, but part of that, um, if you really want to learn who someone is, um, gather information from them, you know, sitting across the table probably isn't the ideal way to do it. And so David was an athlete and he, sometimes we'd play tennis with people. The, the tennis and golf outing is a whole other story. That was a once a year thing, like a one day thing. And they brought all the managers. I actually don't know that that was, um, that came out of a need um, when, <laughs> when the tennis tournament, I think it was back then, it was the pilot pen. Maybe before, it was the Volvo, maybe before that first came to Yale. The first year they built the courts, they had a problem with the courts. And on a beautiful sunny day, the main court started bubbling and they couldn't play. And so they brought helicopters in to dry it. And they actually had a funding gap as a result of that. So Rick Levin went to David and says, is there any way you could do like a fundraiser because we need to keep this tournament here? So he did this one-off thing. And, and you know, a lot of the managers said, well, you've made us a lot of money. Sure, we'll give some money to Yale. And, and it became an annual thing. It didn't. It didn't start that way. A lot of the really interesting adaptations um, that became the brand of Yale, as they're being discussed now, started as just like circumstance. And then you're like, oh, aha. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's one example. Another um, was this internship program. So there was no internship program that people talk about today when I was there. Um, but what did happen was like, David would be asked by the Yale School of Management, can you help our students find some jobs? And he's like, I don't know, I guess, like, I don't know who these students are. And one year he went and he, he found two students and he put them into two different summer jobs. And when they came back, he said, why don't you come just like have lunch, tell us about it. And one of the places was pretty much a disaster. And he didn't know. And so this information comes back. And I, again, this is probably in 1996. This is a long time ago. Um, 
And they say, wow, what, what a great way to, you know, we think we know what's going on in these managers, but let's put a mole in there for the summer. Let's structure it so they have to write a report to us about what's going on. They won't really understand that's what we're doing. The managers are going to, and, you know, it's let's amazing. gather information that way. That's so it became brilliant. this, it became this, you know, internship program with the managers. And again, I wasn't there at the time to know, hey, like this is our secret mission to do this, but pretty clearly it's another way of gathering information. So there are a lot of those things that the publicity about Yale is another great story. So when I worked at Yale, David said absolutely no publicity, nothing that will not benefit the university, university first. And he used to write a every five year report. So I joined in 1992. There was a 1990 report. There was a 1995 report. There was no intention to do anything after. Jay Light, who was a finance professor at Harvard Business School at the time, later became the dean of the business school, kept coming in and saying, hey, David, I think we should write a case study about you at Harvard. And he was like, no, no, no. And Jay kept coming. And he eventually, after two or three years, he said, look, the story is going to get out. Either you can work with us and tell it the right way or take your chances. Because people would call all the time and he wouldn't respond to anybody, wouldn't respond to anybody. So sure enough, they, they do this case study. And then he writes the piece in 1995. And people would come and say, well, uh, we, we want to know about you. And he would hand them the piece in the case study. And people loved it. And went, wow, this is like controlled communication. And then what do you know? They became an annual report and it became a series of case studies. And, but it wasn't by design as a way to control the media. If you really look at the number of times David was in public over 35 years, like telling his story, so small. Yeah. Very controlled, very, very small. There was this thing that everybody refers to at the Council of Foreign Relations a couple of years ago. Because there was a hedge fund manager he had money with that basically said, please do this. Well, you know, but he did lots of private conversations with the development office, would take him around and he'd join, you know, a group of 20 alums in a private session. He would give the same basic speech about how they invest in money. And he found money managers from that. Because what do you know? It's Yale. These are the wealthiest alums. Some of them made their money managing money. Oh, pretty interesting. Like maybe those are people you'd want to meet. So there are all these kinds of ways that by embracing the whole ecosystem of Yale and his role and having the duration and the seat, he just created all of these little micro competitive advantages over time. Ted, what happens next? Does, does the... Does somebody step into the shoes and try to carry that legacy forward? Does the organization evolve into a different model? Love to hear your your thoughts on the yeah. future of the Yale endowment. Yeah. So let's start with the near certainties, not certainties, nothing certain. But unlike Harvard, when Jack Meyer left, you know, Jack Meyer left in... I don't remember when it was, 2000 or something like that. They had a very different model at the time, but, but a very successful one. When he left, he founded a hedge fund. The, they were managing a lot of money internally. Um, and his hedge fund convexity basically bought the positions from Harvard and left Mohammed el Aryan with a big pile of cash to put to work. Um, unlike that situation, uh, whoever steps into the role at Yale, and there's, there's probably two ways of thinking about who that might be, um, is set up to win for the next five or 10 years. It's very, very difficult. All right, these are existing relationships, long duration with managers. Over time, those will need to be turned over. Managers will retire. Some things will change. Um, but 90% of the return is probably baked in for the next three years, maybe five. And so you're in the situation where the returns will continue to be quite good on a relative basis. Who knows what they'll be on an absolute basis? Um, and And probably people will attribute that to David and his legacy. Um, so there's two different ways of moving forward. You cannot, there, there will not be another David Swenson. Um, there just won't. So the most logical one is um, carry the torch forward as best you can, which probably means uh, putting someone in the seat who was trained by him. Um, there are a small number of people on the outside, you know, a, a Rob Wallace, a, a Peter Ammon, um, um, a Kimberly Sargent at the Hewlett Foundation, who I imagine, Yale, if they were wise, would be reaching out to and saying, hey, do you want to come back? Um, there's a good chance most of them won't. There are one or two that I think could, um, but there are a bunch. You know, Seth Alexander, who's still a dear friend of mine at MIT, there's no way he's leaving. He's built this at MIT over 16 years. He has his own team, his own investments, his own model. His family is there. But there, a lot of these people have young families too. So there's a lot of considerations, and there's a small number of people that fit that. Um, 
I don't know the team there today, other than a couple of the senior people who were there when I left, and none of them um, want to take over or would be the right people to take over. My understanding is that there have been there are a few people that have been there for more than ten years. Um, I don't know them to know are they the right people, but those are also logical potential candidates to carry forward the torch. The other is if you don't have one of those people, what do you do? Um, and that's where you say, okay, like David was innovative. Let's go find, who do we know in the Yale ecosystem that's between 30 and 35 years old that by all accounts is innovative and brilliant and let's try it again. Um, Yale has a, a history of doing that, right? The current Yale president who Peter Salave, who by all accounts is not quite as successful as the prior one, Rick Levin, but Rick was an economics professor, a career Yale guy who they made president and thrived. And Peter was a psychology professor, a beloved professor and a career Yale guy who when Rick left, they fit that model. This model is go find a 31 year old who someone special in the Yale community thinks this is unlike anyone else I've ever seen before. And that's possible too. Well, speaking as a 33 year old, I'm available for the job. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, I, I, I think like the, this sort of gets to the question of diversity though, right? Cause like, you know, a lot of the people who are the natural choices for, for this are people who like the seed was planted 25 years ago for them to be in a conversation now to run this, to run this pool of capital. Um, I think it's really interesting that the, like there's one of the last big headlines that David made was around this like push on, on greater manager diversity. Um, and I'm curious, like, how would you account for that? And like, what would indicate that it was a success? What would indicate that it was a failure? Like, um, do you, you know, believe that it's a, a, a sign of momentum? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what his particular thinking was. We saw the output of whatever that process was. We don't know what his thinking was. There are, I'm sure, a few people internally who do. Um, you know, I have my own views on that, having spent some time on the podcast, uh, both kind of a, a, in an ESG miniseries and a diversity miniseries. And you know, my own view is that um, this industry is the wrong place to start, that this is the industry that needs to lag, that it starts in corporate America, it starts in universities and who they're bringing in. And we're seeing that, right? We're seeing the, the incoming first year class and colleges uh, from a diversity perspective is going to look unlike any other before it. Um, that is, that means that 20 years from now, the asset management industry could look quite different, um, but it's not going to look quite different two years from now. Um, and, and, you know, that has to do with the people. It also has to do with the structure where most, most people's answer to diversity is I'll go hire a diverse owned manager, but that's starting from a premise that there aren't enough diverse owned managers. So why would you want to go fish in a pond that you've already agreed is suboptimal in some ways as your solution to a problem. Um, so the other, the other challenge for Yale and, and what David set out is that most of Yale's managers are small. Um, so I have an upcoming podcast with Katie Milkman at Penn who wrote this fabulous book called How to Change and it's a habit formation. Um, it's a habit formation and change book. It's really exceptional. And one of the things we talked about was was this in, in asset management. And she said, well, one of the things that you find that works is when an organization decides they want to hire a more diverse population, what they should do is not hire in singletons. Don't hire one person, hire five, because when you hire five, it's pretty obvious if they're all five white males. If you hire one person per year, and that ends up being a white male, each time you could say, well, we're only hiring one person. This is the best candidate. And it adds up. So... Similarly, I think if you look at Yale's portfolio, most of those investment organizations, certainly relative to a BlackRock or a Blackstone, they're very, very small. And so if you have 10 people in your organization um, and you hire one additional woman, does that mean you're more diverse or is it just you hired one additional? You're not moving the needle. So, you know, my belief is that in asset management, it has to start with the large organizations that are the incumbents that that have the industry concentration and their hiring practices. And we're seeing that, you know, you're, you're seeing Larry Fink talk about this. You're going to see Steve Schwartzman talk about this more and more. So you'll make inroads. It's just going to take a long time. 
Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's an easy problem. Uh, <laughs> in my personal, I, I feel like I, I spend my life working out these twenty-year problems. I'd like to pick something that has a one-year horizon. That would be fantastic. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. There we go. <laughs> Ted, thank you so much. I know we've already overused the amount of time we, we told you we would yeah, talk to you. Um, it's a delight to have you on oh, DOS Pod. So um, fun. And a formal a formal <laughs> member of the free... I, you know, I, I saw that... I was telling Ashby, I saw that you guys just did an, another podcast, and I haven't listened yet because I'm sure you just spent the whole time talking about me. Yeah, we um, did. Yeah. We did, yeah. Sloan. We did. It's, yeah. um, probably be weird. <laughs> and, and Ted, we would be remiss from, from talking about how awesome your book is. If the, the book oh, yeah. is like a whole set of amazing insights after almost 200 episodes of, of Capital Allocators, um, you did a fantastic job of distilling down like the key insights for anybody interested in managing capital. So check it out. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank yeah. you, Sloan. Yeah. It's, it's great fun as you always. On. Yeah. yeah see, I, you, see you both soon. See you soon. Thanks, Ted. Bye, Ted. I would say that this new recording technology is working out pretty well. Ted is fantastic. Ted is the best. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's the recording technology. Ted Seides technology. We're powered by Ted here in this It app. is basically Ted is an all-knowing software. Um, <laughs> he's like Max Headroom, for those of you that have yeah. never. Do you know what Max I, Headroom I mean, is? I So I, I know I walked past a VHS tape of Max Headroom as a kid and was not allowed to rent it. Yeah, um, I think it was like you know, a TV that ha that was an, a, a disembodied head, and it would talk to you. It was like the first AI. It's like I find that very relatable. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I mean it's like Max Headroom was like the first Siri, right? Like oh, we now man. have it, we just don't have a head for it. Mm, that's that's really a loss. Um, mm. But you know, oh. For the first time ever, an inline sound effect and the oh. transition to the Dear Ashby segment of the show. Here it is. Uh, it is. This is when we take listener questions. If you are a listener, and if you're hearing this, you are by definition a listener, you can send us a question, uh, freemoneypod at gmail.com, or there's a great way to ask questions on freemoneypodcast.com. Um, and on top of that, hey, you know, while we're begging, give us a review. You oh, yeah. Know, maybe, uh, you know, put 10 or $15 in the mail. <laughs> Yeah, write write our first names on it and just and just send it. You yeah. know, um, no, it's like Santa Claus. They know how to get it to us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got a mail guy. We've got a good. <laughs> yeah, guy. we got a mail guy. You just put Sloan and Ashby. Put it on the front. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that'll work great. Um, so, the first question we have from the listeners this week is: I mean, this is a great one. Um, S and P is increasing the primacy that climate transition risk has in its ratings processes. Um, and I love this because the question is, should we be worried? Um, <laughs> I love should, that too. You know, the, yeah, this is, you know, though a good idea, this sounds a bit like yet another ESG rating structure to understand. So the, the, the author of this question is very savvy. Um, and, and so I feel obligated to provide um, a, a pretty well-reasoned response. First off, mm. um, the person recognizes that ratings um, can contribute to more financial risk as they did in the financial crisis. So th th should we be worried is always a question that you should be asking about ratings. And also knows that most of the tools we use to assess ESG, environment, social, and governance factors, are kind of a dog's breakfast of rating um, oh, God. messiness. It's hot, gar it's hot garbage. I, I was like uh, working on a white paper for uh, for someone and like there's I came across something where like someone actually compared rating structures to each other That's um, right. and yeah, and found they were like 0.38 to 0.7 correlated with each other. So like, there's like, you know, coin flip. Yeah. Uh, it's terrible. Whether or not they actually back each other up. So th those are the two premises, which I find insightful, which then gets me to the final point. Should we be worried? And actually I almost feel obligated to take the counterpoint here. Um, I obviously hate the convoluted climate ratings that you're just talking about, but I love the fact that climate is now being integrated into the existing bond ratings. This is, we can interpret it, the conventional world of finance, which we may all agree is broken and dysfunctional, but these are the conventional players um, trying to bring climate into their process 
rather than us creating some screwy process on the side that's for climate. To bring this into an analogy, I often describe like a win in this ESG space as when something moves in an investment memo from the ESG section into the risk section. So in an mm. investment memo, you're, you're writing about the thing you're buying and you always have to detail the risks. Well, nowadays we add an ESG section with diversity inclusion, with environment, with labor, all that kind of stuff. But if it becomes truly material to the investment, it shouldn't be in the ESG section, it should be in the risk section. This move I would describe as potentially, I don't know all the details, akin to moving from the ESG section, the kind of climate ratings, into the risk section, the traditional mm. rating provided by S&P. So we should monitor it and watch how it's implemented. But I'd say by and large, this is a good, this is a good outcome. It also, I, you know, you heard it here first. I predict that this will lead to a uh, range of um, alt-right uh, non-climate rating agencies, um, you know, and in effect, basically push not considering climate change out of traditional credit uh, discussions. Yeah, that's a good point. We're probably now looking at um, a new set of facts. You know, it's already hard enough for us to have like shared facts, but as uh, you know, the, this could actually push people to, you know, choose different rating agencies if they don't like what they see. Yeah. But it will Which, also you know, then lead to new hedge funds that get launched to capitalize on, you know, what people perceive as mispricing of risks. So let's see what happens. Yeah, it'll be, we've got the popcorn ready. Mm. Um, next question is David Swenson diversified into cryptocurrency a few years ago. Wow. And now that the, yeah, I mean, got the guy, he innovates. He yeah. does stuff. He's weird. You know? Yeah, he's weird. Let's get um, weird with David Swenson. That's going to be our And honestly, you know, I think the timing on this t uh, cryptocurrency diversification was like 2018, which wow. was actually straight up great timing. My gosh, um, they probably made a ton of money. Yeah, seriously. It, th this this person goes, now that the market's sold off a bit, it's, you know, I guess the implication is it seems like it might be one of those moments. Should other pools of capital start thinking about how crypto fits into their portfolios? It's definitely coming up all the time now. So, mm. you know, I think there's a little local pension plan even here in the Bay Area run by my friend, Sean Bill, um, they put a 1% in crypto as an alternative to gold. Um, mm. And so he looked like a genius for a while, then he looked a little bit less genius and he'll probably look like a genius again uh, if it all comes back. But I, I would say like most of the organizations are kind of focused on the picks and shovels of this space. So mm -hmm. getting into the exchanges, into the wallets, into all the different stuff that float around the crypto and Bitcoin spaces rather than buying the Bitcoin itself. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think as Yale did and as Sean Bill did at the Transportation Valley Authority or something, um, you know, some are buying it. And maybe, you know, this is the moment if you sort of start seeing this as a buying opportunity. I personally um, expect we'll see this creeping into different portfolios. Yeah, I, I think the one to three percent you know, allocation. I mean, especially we were talking about rebalancing, especially if you do that pretty yeah. well, it seems like a great way to make use of crypto. Um, last question is the sweetest thing ever. What's your favorite plant? Oh, Isn't well, that adorable. Since we started this podcast, I have a new answer, which is any plant purchased by my new carbon offset program. <laughs> <laughs> Feel yeah, free yeah. to send me your money and I will send mm -hmm. you a picture of my plant in my yard. That's um, great. Yeah. So that's the first thing to say. Please, I'm for the Sloan and Ashby carbon offset uh, home mm -hmm. garden project. Yeah. Uh, the second, the, the original answer before our carbon offset uh, plan took hold. Um, and don't be surprised. We're in the business of free money here, right? Yeah. So yep. look. Um, you got it, you know. And I it. like, here's what I like. I got expensive tastes in plants, which is why I got to put this in place. I like Japanese mm -hmm. maples. Oh, wow. Look at her. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's I like, love you know. them. So I, you know, mm. I was, I, I planted four and, and um, mm. I don't have tons of money, so they're not very big. Um, they are very expensive at the big end. I mean, you could spend 500 bucks on a Japanese maple, um, yep. but even on the small ones, they're, you know, 80 bucks. 
Uh, yeah, there. I mean, plants like I mean, I bought all of mine from nonprofit conservatories, so I got great <laughs> prices on them. Um, but like, you know, the the best you're gonna do is fifteen bucks for a plant you love. You know? Oh um, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I guess you could get like cucumbers or whatever, but I'm in a fight with my cucumbers right now. Yeah, I mean, my anyway. parents also gave me a bunch of like really fancy heirloom tomatoes, which um, I'm, I'm been really enjoying. Uh, mm. But in terms of like non-edible plants, the Japanese maples are amazing and they come in very different shapes and sizes. So check them out. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'll throw in another Japanese plant that I'm growing right now. It's Japanese, in, Japanese indigo. Whoa. Um, yeah, I, I stumbled on a nursery that has all kinds of like weird medieval dyes um, that they kind of encourage you to sell. And one of them, Japanese indigo, it's actually quite a beautiful plant. Um, I think got Jap- kind of- I got to go to Japan just because their plants are so badass. They do. That's where they do the cherry blossoms. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I, I I that is like probably the number one country on my bucket list. Yeah, ever. ditto, ditto. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I guess this does it for today. Goodbye. Bye. Let me get rain on them.